This video should cover the basics. A quick note from the get-go, none of the animal features you see on people have anything to do with being infected. And also, there's more info on some of those groups than on others. Felines have the features of various cats from our world. Aslans have the features of lions. They are mostly known for being a part of the ruling class of Victoria, while they originate from Sargon, Lytanian and nations which don't exist anymore. Recent information has also also implied that Aslans might count as a subspecies of felines, which makes sense as lions are cats. Parrows have the features of various types of dogs from our world. They are known for their natural loyalty. Reba or Reproba have the features of hyenas from our world. Lupos have the features of wolves. Vulpos have the features of foxes. They all have a very keen sense of smell. It also gets stated way too often that vulpos are teasing in nature. Ursus have the features of various types of bears from our world. Ursus usually are physically strong and have a very solid physique. Anate have the features of ferrets, otters and the like. Zalax have the features of various types of rodents from our world. They are considered to usually not be physically strong. Caprine have the features of goats, rams or sheep. Elafia have the features of various types of deer. Most Elafia live in the frigid parts of Sami, but some live in Ursus and the north of Kazimierz. Itra have the features of one very specific type of deer. It's said that thanks to the cold environment they usually live in, Itra have rather strong resilience and endurance. Forte have the features of cows and bulls. They come with a natural sturdiness and are extraordinarily strong. Minosi and Forte specifically are known to have very smooth horns. Kuranta have the features of horses. They are sturdy and have a naturally high speed and mobility. A Kuranta is very likely to outperform people from all of the other races in a race. Cortis have the features of rabbits or bunnies. A unique way of producing hormones has given them the ability to handle nighttime activities way better than others. It's their thing to eat food at night. Cortis are usually rather energetic. Cruz is an exception to that rule. It is also implied that they are usually rather fast. Keratos have the features of rhinoceroses. The only Kerato we know is Bubble, but she does not properly represent them. Bubble is said to be about as large as her father's leg. Grown Kerato can get way over 2 meters tall, and it's confirmed that Bubble has yet to grow. It gets said that putting a stop to a charging Kerato is like stopping a hulk of agricultural machinery with a brick on its accelerator. Petram have the features of turtles. Arcosauria have the features of crocodiles and alligators and such. Their tails are the Arcosauria's greatest pride. It's widely disputed in the Arcosauria community on what they prefer, thick tails or thin tails. Entire tribes have formed around the opinions on that question. There exist special tail clamps specifically made for Arcosauria use so that their tails don't cause them too much trouble in their day-to-day -day life. And in case you wondered, the double horns you find on Estelle are not normal for Orcosoria, she just has a special mutation triggered by Oripathy. Arcosauria have a bestial instinct inside of them, which you can call Orcosauria war spirit. They are seen as a warrior race by most people. Tears are seen as a sign of weakness to Arcosauria, and they don't ever cry in front of another person. Anura have the features of frogs. They come with a natural ability to produce poison in their bodies. They originate from an area known as Curtain Valley, which can be found vaguely somewhere within Sargon, although it gets described as politically independent. Outside of that area, they get seen as toxic or as poison itself. Anura outside of Kertun live a life of fear and being ostracized. Phidia or Pythia. Those carry the features of snakes. In the past it seemed like Phidia and Pythia were two words for the same people, but very soon another Pythia operator will release, from which we can deduce that there has to be some sort of difference between Pythia and Phidia. Savra have the features of various types of lizards. Usually a Savra's skin serves them as their natural camouflage. Rangers is an exception, as he is considered to be an albino. 
Some Savra even have the natural ability to change the color of their skin and blend in with their surroundings. Make no mistake though, even is a special case as his camouflage is the result of Origenium arts. Savra have rather long life expectancies, but it is not common that a Savra will live up to 150 years. Liberi have the features of all kinds of different birds from our world. All Liberi are said to have excellent eyesight. There's a large amount of subraces for Liberi. Flint, for example, belongs to one that is naturally small and weak, but insanely fast. They also love flowers, especially colorful ones. Silence belongs to one that is renowned for having very good hearing, and Helager belongs to one with a very long lifespan. That being said, Liberi are said to have rather short life expectancies in general. We don't have the exact numbers, but at some point Huhu Yeye Yarak says that six years were one seventh of her life, which would set her maximum life expectancy at around 42 years, but I don't know whether that is enough information to make a proper claim. Dracos have the features of dragons from western mythology. They come with a power that gets called Draco's flames or Draco arts, and come with a sturdy body. Dracos will often get mistaken for Vuivas instead, because they are very rare. Two decades ago, the Draco bloodline, which used to rule Victoria together with the Aslans, supposedly was wiped out. Vuiva have the features of wyverns. They are considered to be very strong physically. It's said that you could literally starve a Vuiva for an entire month and they could still knock you out. And in order to make them pass out from hunger, you would have to starve them for months. It also even gets implied that infected Vuiva are rare. Vuiva have an instinctive madness which often causes them to show violence and savagery. Manticore have the features of Manticore. Yes, they do. Because the only Manticore we know is Manticore, it might seem to you like turning invisible is a natural ability for them, but that is not true as our Manticore just has it due to her oripathy. It also gets implied that Manticore are rather rare in general. Killin have the features of the Kirin. Lung have the features of dragons from Eastern mythology. Oni have the features of Oni. Oni are a mystery to many people. They are very diverse and it gets stated that it seems like the only common characteristic the Oni have is the fact that they are all from Higashi. Most Oni lack composure and are very aggressive and fierce in battle. Durin have the features of dwarves. Based on the Durin, named Durin, you might think that all of them are lazy and sleep all the time, but that is indeed false. Most Durins are considered lively by nature and hate confinement. Usually Durin live in massive underground cities, but there are many who visit the surface, mostly because they think that it would be fun. There are also those who completely leave the underground with the goal of finding a new way of living. On the surface, they often get mistaken for kids. Aegir have the features of various forms of aquatic life from our world. It has been stated that Aegirians are sensitive to the scent of seawater. If Aegir stay too long in a dry environment, they may experience skin discomfort. Even allergic reactions might happen. Despite that, most Aegir cannot breathe underwater. The Aegir living in the nation of Iberia face very heavy discrimination. However, that doesn't mean that it's the same same in every other nation though. Higashi for example has a significant population of Aegir and they get seen and see themselves as regular Higashians. Elves have the features of elves. They have very long lifespans and also very unique powers which are not Originium arts. Elves are more sensitive to Originium than most other people. Even slight increases in the amount of particles around them can really worsen their health. While elven nature forces them to distance themselves from Originium powered modern society, Many just moved into regular civilization anyway, where they live very difficult lives trying to avoid Originium while fully knowing that it would one day inevitably kill them anyway. Mülleis describes how there's at least one elven settlement in Sami in which they live according to their nature, and we also know that elves are actively being discriminated against in the nation of Ursus. Yo, real quick, these videos take a lot of time, so subscribe to the channel. Sarkas are very special. You gotta pay some good attention here. 
Most Sarkas are very strong, physically. They also have a natural talent for Originium arts, however they are way more susceptible to Oripathy than pretty much all other people. Countless Sarkas are burdened with Oripathy from birth. Throughout history, the Sarkas homeland, Kasdel, has been destroyed multiple times because of which the Sarkas have become accustomed to just drifting around. A large amount of them just wander around in the world, only thinking about how they're gonna make it to the next day. There exists hatred against the Sarkas pretty much everywhere on Terra, although the level of animosity varies from place to place. Even uninfected Sarkas get discriminated against. Because of all of that, the Sarkas have become used to Oripathy. It doesn't matter to them anymore whether they get hated because of their infection or because they are Sarkas. The Sarkas come with a large variety of subraces. Now, the game literally states that research on the Sarkas and their traits is incomplete, therefore there's more information on some of them than on others. Banshee. Most of the Banshees are female. One of the few male Banshees is Rhodes Island Elite Operator Logos. The Banshees are known to create aromatics, which they only give to their most beloved ones. A single drop of them is enough to fill somebody with inspiration and creativity. Gargoyles. They get referred to as the children of soil and stone. They are said to give out little handmade sculptures as proof of friendship. Right now, the regent of Kasdel is actively searching for any sign of the gargoyles, so it seems to be likely that the gargoyles are rare, lost, in hiding, or something like that. That being said, it's also implied that Operator Mudrock might be a gargoyle. Vampires. Two vampires we know very well are Closure and Warfarin, but the majority of vampires are not as nice as them. Vampires are feared, even among the rest of the Sarkas, as they are known and feared as blood-sucking monsters. People have an instinctive fear of vampires and that's a good thing. If you ever run into a vampire, run. Although it might be too late by then, anyway. Most vampires feed upon blood. However, vampires have developed various ways that help them fight against that desire, artificial blood, for example. Vampires have very long lifespans. Warfarin, for example, says that it's been two centuries since she had last grown any taller. Vampires also get stated to have red eyes and fangs which are retractable. Further, it gets implied that they are also capable of seeing in the dark. They also don't appear to have any horns on their heads. That being said, just because a Sarkas doesn't have horns, that does not automatically mean that they are a vampire, as it is confirmed that some Sarkas just cut their horns off in order to hide their identity. Nachtzera. Nachtzera are described to be more terrifying than the Banshees. The Nachtzera take their nutrients from war. They devour life and use it. The only Sarkas we can 100% confirm to be a Nachtzera is the Nachtzera King, who literally feeds on the flesh of his enemies. At the same time, it gets said that a Nachtzera's own flesh would rot a vampire's teeth. Wendigos are stated to be the oldest Sarkas bloodline and the most vicious clan. Wendigos come with a naturally high metabolism and a strong self-repair capacity. Further, one source states that there are a few dozen Wendigos left who still live in Colombia and Ursus. Another source states that the few Wendigos left can be found in the north of Ursus where they battle against strange monsters. Diablo. The Diablo are extinct. They used to be a very powerful sub-race. Throughout the land, there exist remains of the Diablo in the form of crystals, the so-called diabolic shards. Some of those shards have gotten into the hands of very powerful people. Damatsti, or the Damatsti Cluster. They are a collective which far surpasses the Seaborn in their unity. They are not interested in anything but themselves. The cluster is capable of separating into multiple shards, which are capable of shape-shifting. Cyclops. We don't know a lot about the Cyclopses, apart from the fact that there are Cyclopses in Sami, and that they seem to be capable of making prophecies. 
liches. The liches have a strong mastery of dimensional space which exceeds the cognition of many people. They are also known to be very keen on self-preservation and always look for a way to hide somewhere. Usually the liches stay in their library. Goliath. We know that the Goliath exist and we can assume that they are decent in dealing with heat. Djal. For the Djal, we literally only know that they exist. Hmm, the Sarkas really seem like a very diverse group of people, right? Anasa. The word Anasa means one without roots in the ancient language of the Sarkas. The Anasa once were a part of a Sarkas tribe which traveled to the east. They were separated from the main group and ended up staying in the northwest of Yen. There they changed their name to Anasa and became a part of Yen. While they integrated into society, they usually keep their distance from the cities. Anasa are known to have a black halo behind their heads. Sancta have the features of angels. A Sancta's wings and halo appear when they say their first words. When a Sancta is dying, their halos and wings will start to dim. Many Sancta see their halos as something annoying, as wearing headwear for example feels gross to them and will give them headaches. The only Sancta who can wear hats are the ones with a lot of training or weirdos. Their halos allow the Sancta to sense each other, feel each other's emotions and thus understand each other better. That does not mean that they all live in one big hive mind, they are just emotionally linked to each other. This ability gets called empathy or empathetic sensing. The Sancta are very accustomed to having empathy, the ability is nothing special to them, it's just like a common sense. They can't use empathy on non-Sancta though. To most people, Sancta and their guns are inseparable concepts. In Arknights, complex originium arts are required in order to use guns, because of which most gun users you can find are Sancta. It's not because of any special training, they are just actually naturally good at it. Most Sancta are believers in the faith of the Lateran Church. They believe in the law. A Sancta's halos and wings are proof of them being accepted by the law. All Sancta know violate the rules, aka the commandments of the law, and you must pay the price. The commandments are instinct. Due to the law and empathy, it is inherently difficult for Sancta to show hostility towards another Sancta. But it is also very difficult for them to hide hostile feelings in front of another Sancta, because they can just sense each other's feelings. And while showing hostilities against another Sancta itself does not violate the law, a Sancta is still faced with massive psychological pressure and a sense of moral condemnation if they do it. Sancta are allowed to use various forms of violence against each other, but they are not, under no circumstances allowed, to point their firearms against another Sancta. That is both a commandment as well as a part of their natural instinct. If you have done your homework, you will have heard the words ancients and elders in the context of Arknight's races. At some point in the past, the elders used to rule over all of Terra and the ancients were their subjects. A big thing the elders had over the ancients was that they have legendary powers, their lineages being the sources of those powers. In the vast time that has passed since then, the elders have lost their legendary powers. Compared to the ancients, nowadays there's nothing really different. The downfall of the elders really began over a thousand years ago in an empire ruled by the Hippogriff, which would later be known as Ursus. The Hippogriff based their policies around racial discrimination and on taking the wealth of the Ursus they were ruling, which eventually led to the Ursus uprising, an event which would represent the ancients standing up to the rule of the Elders. After that uprising, the Elders' rule over Terra gradually waned. Another group of confirmed Elders are the Pegasi. 
They used to be the rulers of the nation of Kazimierz until they were overthrown. To this day, Kazimierz has many Pegasi. The interesting thing here is that Pegasi on one hand get called a rare kind of Kuranta, on the other hand Pegasi get called a full-on race. Now the thing is that based on that alone, you could make the assumption that all of the races on Terra associated with ruling classes might be elders. The Aslans, for example, tick a lot of the boxes that the Pegasi tick as well, but we don't have enough information to really answer that question. Another question would be whether races like the Elves or the Durin exist within the Ancient and Elders dynamic as well, or whether they exist outside of that. But we also don't have enough information to answer that that question. There are certain people though which we can absolutely 100% confirm to be neither ancients nor elders. We will now discuss very important details from these events, jump to this timestamp if you plan on reading all of this by yourself. Alright, now that the quitters are gone. Recent events have revealed that the people we know as Sarkas were the original inhabitants of the world we know as Terra. Once upon a time, only Sarkas lived on Terra. Back in the day, the Sarkas were known as Teikas, and Kasdel did not refer to a city or a nation, it referred to the entire world. Back then, the Sarkas absolutely did not live in the state that they are in right now. Before the Elders and the Ancients had come to Terra, the Sarkas just lived. After the Ancients and the Elders arrived, Kasdel was destroyed. Nowadays, nothing remains of the old Kasdelian civilization. But I assume that's why there are Sarkas ruins all throughout Terra, and not just in the parts that get called Kasdel today. The Tekas are closely connected to every corner of the world. The Sarkas are said to have a collective racial memory. It gets stated that Sarkas memories get passed on through blood. The collective souls of the Sarkas is a thing, and the soul of a Sarkas who passes away returns to their tribe. The souls of the dead Sarkas whisper of being the former masters of this world and about how they were slaughtered, oppressed and enslaved for so very long. They see all non-Sarkas as invaders. And that's why the Sarkas are so diverse. The Sarkas are not a race bound by blood. History has made all of those people Sarkas. The term Sarkas literally is a derogatory term invented by the ancients and elders to describe all of the people originally inhabiting Terra. And as time moved on, it later became a rallying cry for the oppressed. That's why the differences between the individual sub-races, including in appearance, are so huge. And that is where we have to talk about the Sancta. Throughout all of recorded history, the Sancta and the Sarkas have been slaughtering each other. The origins of their conflict are long lost. While an old Sancta story talks about how the Sancta were slaughtered by the Devil's army up until the Saints started to lead them and they built Lateran city together, which was meant to be a paradise for the Sancta, on the Sarkas side we find talk of the Sancta's betrayal of the Sarkas, and we get the information that some Sarkas, who refer to themselves as Sancta, deserted their duty. In Lone Trail we find a neutral figure that says, a strict chain of command gives the Sancta their identity, a machine lacking any self-awareness which has been ordered to become a god, yet it doesn't even know how to fulfill that task. Remember how we said earlier that the Sancta's abilities and features are the result of their connection to something called the Law? In Guide Ahead we hear that the Law interprets itself like a machine. In a hall below the Lateran Basilica, we can hear low humming, just like a machine. It gets stated that the Sancta are only Sancta because the law links them all together. It gives them their identity. 
We also know that it is possible for a Sancta to lose their connection to the law. Let's talk about the concept of a fallen Sancta. A Sancta falls the moment they point their gun at another Sancta. We mentioned a bit earlier how that is the greatest sin a Sancta can commit. The commandments don't protect a fallen Sancta. That means that the Sancta are allowed to shoot at fallen Sancta. Fallen Sancta don't have empathy any longer. They are also no longer connected to all of the other Sancta. Even their guns reject them. Essentially, a fallen Sancta is no longer a Sancta at all, because they acted against the most important commandment itself. Not only all of that though, a fallen Sancta will also start to develop the physical features of a Sarkas, like horns and a tail. Due to all of that, we can now essentially confirm with a 95% likelihood that the Sancta are the descendants of Sarkas who were turned into Sancta by a machine called the Law at some point in the distant past. And if a Sancta falls, they lose their connection to the Law and seemingly re gain their suppressed Sarkas features. This is the conclusion that we can make based on the information available to us at EN at that exact moment. A very important detail to note here, this is all hidden knowledge. All of the information about the Teikas civilization, the ancients and elders arriving at a later point, about what the law actually is, the origins of the Sancta, none of this is common knowledge to the average person on Terra. Another highly important piece of information, Kalcid herself has confirmed that the Sarkas are not too different from the rest of all of the races. They are neither superior nor inferior. As time has went on, Originium has shaped both sides into similar forms, into one big humanity. After all, Originium means unification. Crazy stuff, huh? Now let's welcome the quitters back. Hey, welcome back! You have not missed anything important. Weird animals. They live for a very long time. High Priest has said that he is so old that the concept of time does not exist to him. He has genuinely forgotten when he was born. At least some of them consider each other to be their kin and mention a common origin. Many of them know each other. They are also immortal. As in literally unkillable. Please note, though, that not every anthropomorphic character in Arknights falls into the same category as those weird animals. Fer and Mood are very powerful beings. Yera and the Nyan siblings fall into this category. In ancient times, the people thought of certain creatures as gods, but as civilization advanced, those creatures gradually went into hiding. Nowadays, not many of them are still alive. And of those still alive, most of them are not easy to get along with. Something they all can be connected with are very special abilities. Abilities that are said to reject reason and that have nothing to do with Originium Arts. An important note here, the Nyan siblings are not real Feran Mood, they are proxies. A Feran Mood named Sui has separated itself into a number of proxies with individual personalities. The siblings. Those Feran Mood proxies are supposed to one day reunite back into Sui. Due to that, some people argue whether those proxies even meet the definition of a living being. The members of Alive Until Sunset are also Feran Mood. It's stated that there is a different original form to them and that they used to be massive creatures which disappeared from the ocean and now live on the surface while they are ready to evolve back at any time. For Yera we don't know what her original form is or whether she's a proxy or whatever. Demons. It's confirmed that the Northern Tundra is inhabited by demons. The nations bordering that region, Ursus and Sami specifically, actively fight those demons. Remember how it was stated earlier that the few Sarkas Wendigos still left are stated to be fighting the demons in the north on the side of Ursus. The Seaborn are a collective of very diverse creatures living in the ocean in an ever-growing and expanding living space. Seaborn are capable of mutating themselves. If they for example come to land and have to hunt prey, they can develop limbs which allow them to run. 
The seaborn don't really understand the concept of individuality and see themselves as individual parts of a great collective. We the many is how they refer to themselves. An important figure to the seaborn is a creature known as Ishamla, an existence beyond the concept of death. All the seaborn know its name. An important thing, the Seaborn don't call Ishamla their god, they just want Ishamla to lead them and make choices for them. Research done by Aegir states that these creatures are something like the Seaborn's forefathers and do not count as gods. Research done by Iberia states that those creatures, which they refer to as Leviathans, are essentially the gods of the Seaborn. It was also stated that the Leviathans and the Feranmut are not the same, and also that there are multiple Leviathans. The nation of Aegir suffers a lot from seaborne attacks. One of the weapons they use in order to counter the seaborne are the so-called abyssal hunters. Abyssal hunters get created by taking a person and fusing their body with the cells of a seaborne. This fusion gives the hunters non-ordinary biological properties, thanks to which they possess incredible strength, mobility and senses. An abyssal hunter is in a constant process of metamorphosis, in which they slowly transform into a seaborn. As they transform, they get more sensitive to the seaborn's sense and what they mean. It is said that all abyssal hunters will eventually lose control over themselves because of that transformation. There are confirmed seaborn hybrids out there which are not abyssal hunters. The most famous one of them is Mizuki. And with all of the people covered, it will now be time to talk about how they actually live. Next episode, Nations. Click on the left for a quick summary of Arknet's lore, click on the right for all Arknet's lore videos, click on the center for the second channel, which has way more Arknet's content. Big shout out to Carousel Afa, Chris, Duff Eldo Schild, Elite 117, Erwin Heckler, Jim Shot First, Kevin Arthur, Longo Neo, Salvesa, and Zephyr Renix. Cheers!